to introduce Anna Nirmala, who is Vice President of Strategy and Startups at the American Journalism Project. Anna is joined by Ariel Zoralnik of the Membership Puzzle Project and John Ketchum of AJP. Welcome, so grateful to be joined by all of you and my co-presenters, Ariel and John as well. And so you're at INN Days, which means that you're likely going to be asking for local support from community foundations or funders. And so the purpose of this session is helping you and, and us learning together, think about how we can make sure that you're community centric so that you have a realistic and compelling shot at accessing these sorts of funds and living into your mission. And so there's a lot of ways that you can think about this. And it, when we were all discussing and preparing for this presentation, it felt like the industry lacked concrete definitions around what this means. So today we're seeking to just draw some sharper distinction between audience and community so that your newsroom and organizations can really strategize effectively and make sure that everyone's on the same page. So to begin, we went to newsrooms where we thought that they're doing a really good job at being both audience and community centric. And we asked them to tell us how they define these concepts. So we'll start with Documented and how co-founder and co-executive director Mazin defined this for us. When I think of audience centric, I think of being very data driven in your decision making, analyzing the performance of articles and newsletters and incorporating that into your decision making. Community driven to me is one to one. It's physically or digitally appearing where people are and listening to what they think and incorporating that into your decision making. Another person that we asked is Ashley Alvarado, who's the VP of Community Engagement at KPCC in LAS in California. And she said to us, as an organization, there's obviously value in serving and super serving our existing audience or audiences, but it's essential that we also identify the information needs and habits of the communities that make up our coverage areas too. That's the only way to develop relevance and credibility with these future audiences to support the information ecosystem in a meaningful way to build toward a sustainable future and to potentially address the negative impact journalism has had on certain communities. Lachlan Fields, who leads audience at Mississippi Today says, we use audience data and surveys to know and understand our audience. And we continually optimize how we deliver news based on the needs of our readers. We also find ways to constantly and consistently engage with our audience with the goal of enhancing readers' lives through the content and resources we share. Community-centric is about embedding ourselves in communities and building relationships with community stakeholders so we can build trust and deepen loyalty among readers. By being present, literally and intellectually, we can better understand the needs of communities and shine a light on issues that matter most to those readers. Listening and understanding leads to more meaningful storytelling. John. Awesome. Um, so this next uh, uh, um, definition is from um, Erica Peterson, who is the managing editor at Mountain State Spotlight. Um, they are a pretty newsroom, um, and um, I think that they're doing a good job of, of, of um, tackling um, the issues that we're talking about. Um, so uh, Erica says that audience-centric reporting, which centers the people currently reading our journalism, is important to us, as is listening to our audience to uh, to determine what journalism they want and need. To us, community-centric reporting centers the community the story is about and rings true to that community. Hopefully when this work is done well, it is interesting and unearths some insight for people outside that community who may be part of our audience. And when the reporting is truly community-centric, it can potentially bring those community members into our audience. Last one. Yep. Um, and then this next one um, is from um, Candace Fortman, um, who runs Outlier Media in Detroit, along with Sarah Alvarez. Um, the term audience is most often attached to numbers, data, and this silent question of what we can get out of one another to meet our personal needs. There is also the larger and more self-defeating problem of the audience being defined in many newsrooms as white, cisgendered, and not disabled. Community-centric turns that on its side and asks us to consider who people are, what the collective needs to make the individual, or what are the collective needs to make the individual more sustained, and how can we be of service um, to one another? And I think anybody who's familiar with Outliers Model and the work they do, um, you know, would know that that's pretty spot on. Um, they are uh, focusing on these issues that we're talking about too, and, and we'll talk about them a little later, some more. 
Sure. So I think um, a big thing that, you know, we want to do when we start off with this is kind of define, you know, the terms of what, of what we're talking about. Um, the newsroom leaders that we talked about before um, already um, did it, but I think that it's good for us to, you know, start off with this um, or with these definitions as, as kind of the bedrock of what we're talking about. So um, the way that, you know, we were thinking about audience uh, when we were, you know, talking about this panel, and please chime in um, um, if you think anything needs to be added to these, but your audience um, is people who already read, listen, and engage with your work. Um, uh, there are also people who already use your products, your newsletters, subscribers, um, and they're your social media followers. But, you know, I think the key thing is, is that there are people who've already kind of shown loyalty to you um, in some way. Um, and we think of your community as all of the people in your coverage area, even the ones who aren't readers, donors, or newsletter subscribers. Um, these are your, your, your future audience members. Um, and, you know, we also realize that community centricity is pretty it's not a new concept, but I think for a lot of newsrooms, uh, it um, it may be a newer thing um, that they're focusing on if they have um, if they haven't already. Um, kind of audience centric work. The things that go to the left side of this slide are things that we've been talking about for years, right? Like how do you increase your newsletter audience? How do you increase traffic? All of that. So we just wanted to make that clear here that you know that community centricity is kind of like the next goalpost of what a lot of newsrooms may be focusing on. And when we were actually, when we first met to discuss this presentation, I don't even remember exactly what our starting point was, but we realized about halfway through our first brainstorm session that even we were sort of muddying up the difference between audience and, and community. And we were using the words interchangeably for things that were actually very different. And that is actually what shifted this presentation towards, let's actually get a little bit clearer about the difference between audience and community um, and help newsrooms understand when you're having a conversation about each of these and what each of these can sort of lead to from a revenue and strategy perspective. Um, and one of the other newsrooms that we spoke to when we were sort of asking people to weigh in on these definitions is Sahan Journal based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, Mukhtar, their founder gave us such great examples. He didn't just give us definitions. He showed how he distinguishes in their sort of editorial content mix between the work that they do that is about gen generating greater audience reach and the work they do that is about generating greater community impact. And so you see here sort of how he defined it. Um, their audience engagement work centers on the audience they already have, who already has access to, is aware of, and consumes their journalism. And an example that he gave of that is an Instagram explainer that they did last summer about how Minneapolis residents would get involved in police reform. So they were not focused on getting it from new readers, they were packaging it for the people that are already following them. Um, and then he shifted to sort of community engagement, which of course centers on the sort of underrepresented communities. They may already serve those groups but those groups might not be aware that they're being served by Sahan Journal or feel connected to it. And the example that he gave of that is a collaboration that they did with Somali TV Minnesota to perform the closure of a local neighborhood school and use their sort of megaphone at Sahan Journal to connect the residents to decision makers who are sort of holding those conversations about the future of the school. And most of that work was done through Somali TV more so than Sahan Journal. So it wasn't necessarily their audience. They were getting out in front of a new part of the community that they weren't necessarily reaching. Already, And I thought that these examples from Mukhtar were great because he had such clarity between when something was a community, um, a community engagement effort versus when something was about engaging their existing audience and sort of bringing them further down that audience funnel. Um, and, you know, as we were coming up with the presentation for today, we were thinking about, you know, what does it look like when a newsroom kind of does both of these things well? Um, and I automatically thought, of um, the Texas Tribune and all the work that they did around covering the power outage. And if anybody from the Tribune is on, please uh, chime in, because I'm just kind of obsessed with the way that they covered this. Uh, but, um, but you know, I think as many of you know, there was a huge power outage uh, uh, throughout the state. And this was kind of one of those moments where community-focused distribution or community-focused information needs kind of came to the forefront, right? So like the Texas Tribune, all. Uh, kind of already does a good job with newsletters, with site traffic. You know, I think we've all kind of read that annual report um, um, and 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 been blown away by their progress. But I think that this moment kind of called for them to say, you know, look, let's meet the information needs of our entire community. Um, and I think a good, um, you know, example of this is their text messaging service, and others in the state did it too. But 
I like that their text messaging service kind of gave people the critical information that they needed about like power shutoffs and statuses of when of when power would return. Um, I think there was something on there about where to get clean water. Like that's real kind of like necessary tangible information that everybody in Texas needs, uh, whether or not they're a reader or a newsletter subscriber. Um, and a thing that I also asked, or a thing that I also liked about this is that, you know, they allow people to ask questions, right, which is like kind of, um, you know, the core of, you know, what we're doing and what we're supposed to be doing. So uh, yeah, 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 really, really love this example. Um, and if you all want to know more, uh, please head on over to their site. And I think it's it's just a really good case study, I think, in, in um, how to do this well. Great. So we we quoted Mazen before about how he thinks the about the difference between audience centricity and community centricity. And so one of the things that I really love about Documented is how they do such a great job of just publicly sharing how and why they operate in the ways that they do. And so they started their WhatsApp newsletter in, in 2019 as a way to communicate with Spanish speaking readers here in New York City through a platform that that community already was using to share news and important information. And so they use this newsletter to communicate directly and rapidly with immigrant communities who are struggling to make sense of the Trump administration's changes to immigration law. And it quickly became this hub of information on how to seek out help within New York's immense bureaucracy. After the pandemic happened, Documented started to send many different kinds of information around available resources for this community, economic aid, food banks, things like that. And then they sent out a different kind of message and they asked people to share personal stories about how the pandemic was affecting them. These dozens of stories inspired the making of a documentary called I Know What the Pandemic Means. I highly recommend you all watch if you haven't yet. And I love how Nico Rios, who is Documented's audience editor, kind of captures the essence of this sort of relationship and dynamic. And Nico says, before we had a linear relationship with our community via a weekly newsletter with a summary of the most important news of the week. With the pandemic, community members took the lead, sending us questions to which we didn't always have the answers. That forced us to do what we do best, reporting. However, we would have never achieved this level of engagement without building on trust first. When users understood that we were reporting with them instead of about them, providing the information that they needed and that it was safe to speak with us, we became useful and they started recommending us. So how does this community centricity lead to sustainability? When it comes to philanthropic support, being able to demonstrate that you're really plugged into what those issues are and that the community trusts you to speak on their behalf about it will really help you make that case that you too are an essential service provider when it comes to addressing community needs. With sponsorships, here's how Jay Alred of the Richland Source pitches local companies on supporting the newsroom. The Source's newsroom partnership program helps you make Richland County a better place through support for independent solutions focused reporting. Newsroom partnership bridges the gap between you and the reporters that cover your life. Together, we form a vital partnership that fosters trust, togetherness, and growth through journalism. And I think the, the thing to sort of mention in regards to sponsorships is that local companies want to be a part of the solution to your community. And what Jay sort of pitched there captures so well is how supporting Richland Source is also sort of an investment in making Richland County a better place. Um, journalism that makes the community a better place is highly sponsorable. <laughs> um, and the other sort of revenue that comes out of this sort of community centricity can be audience revenue, um, membership and donations. Um, these two sort of forms of audience revenue really take off when you can authentically make the case that support for your organization is one way to fix something that feels broken in the world. This is something that we've heard at Membership Puzzle Project again and again as people become members of organizations that are taking action on something that gives them sort of angst or they're unhappy to see it out in the community, but they personally don't feel empowered to fix it. Um, they support organizations that they feel like are sort of taking the mantle from them and, and attacking that problem. Um, and so we, we brought these up here because we all sort of, I think, have a very clear understanding of how being audience centric brings revenue in the door, right? We understand increasing reach and then getting people onto your free newsletter and then asking those people on your free newsletter to be subscribers or members or donors. Um, we understand how to sell advertising, but it's still fuzzier how being community centric can also uh, contribute to your organization's sustainability. And so we want to sort of like draw that, that distinction quite clearly here. 
And the other thing that when we were working on this presentation, we realized is that um, there are a million playbooks out there at this point on being audience centric, right? We have um, so many great resources on building up your newsletter list, launching new editorial products, et cetera. But we haven't talked about, uh, we haven't talked nearly as much about what processes you can bring back to your team to begin taking te steps towards being community centric. And they are out there, but they're much more common outside of the journalism space. And they're just beginning to sort of make inroads. And so what Anna, John and I did is sort of went out and collected a few pretty easy to understand processes that you could bring back to your team in order to begin sort of taking these early steps towards more community centric uh, decision making. And it's not, you know, the first one is uh, network and stakeholder mapping. You've likely heard of this before. Um, we use the term stakeholders a whole lot in our newsroom strategy discussions, um, but we're often, when we talk about that, talking about who are all the people who need to be in a meeting to make an editorial decision. But there is also an aspect of sort of stakeholder mapping when you're thinking about being more community centric in your work. Um, so stakeholder mapping or network mapping, they're basically the same thing. They're used interchangeably. Um, it's a process for identifying all the different communities within the community that you serve and getting really clear about who you're reaching already, who you're not reaching yet, and what is the process for reaching those who you're not reaching yet. Um, network mapping is really helpful because at least I've used this before in newsrooms, it gives you a really systematic way to think about your potential audiences. And it gives you a way to think about them beyond their status as a reader or their sort of basic demographics. We tend to talk about our readers as like, brand lovers or loyal readers or casual readers, you know, the GA tags, um, or sort of based on their demographic differences. But stakeholder mapping, is a different way of sort of thinking about all the people that are in your community that you can and should be thinking about how to reach. It's a pretty straightforward process. Um, it's really as simple as these couple steps on the screen. Although at the end of the presentation, we our final slide has a whole list of additional readings and resources, and you'll find a link to a great breakdown of the process from Harkin. Um, but it really is pretty straightforward. You pick the subject at hand. Um, it might be your entire community if you're doing this for the first time, but it's nice people do this for a particular topic like elections or vaccine access or something like that. Um, you will name with your team and bring as many people into this conversation as you can. You will name with your team as many stakeholders as you can who are connected to that subject. You'll get them down on a piece of paper. Um, if you stall out, you might think about some new and new dimensions to introduce to reorganize, uh, regen, re-energize the conversation. So maybe it's like life stage, parents, students, um, retired um, individuals in the community. Maybe their primary language. If you're in a place with a lot of different immigrant communities, their primary language they speak at home is a great way to sort of push that brainstorm another step further. Neighborhoods, et cetera. These are all things that if you sort of stall out, but you feel like there's more there, bringing in a new dimension of like, let's think about all the languages spoken in our city. Let's think about all the different life stages represented in our, in our community it can get keep that going. Um, and then you might want to go, you know, per, community by community, identify those you're presently reaching and those who are out of reach, and then make a priority list for those out of reach communities based on the topic at hand. If it's vaccine access, there might be some that are higher priority than others in terms of getting information out to them. And then you will look at that sort of list of out of reach groups and, and come up with a plan for how you're going to reach them. Maybe you have somebody in your membership who works at an organization that supports people in that community. And so maybe they can sort of be that first place of introduction. You wanna sort of come up with a very deliberate plan for each of these. Um, and I have this great visual here that comes from WBEZ in Chicago that Hartgen shared as part of their election SOS project. And you see here what it looks like when WBEZ use network mapping to think about how they might tackle coverage for vaccine access in the Chicago area. So they have a whole collection of sort of communities here. Um, and so you can see the different dimensions probably they were thinking through. You have people who are vaccine hesitant, you have educators, you have those who are incarcerated and might struggle to get access to vaccines for that reason. Policy analysts who are trying to figure out how you're gonna get those vaccines out the door. You're thinking about people who have transportation barriers. So these are some of the communities that they sort of came up with as they did stakeholder mapping for vaccine access. And um, there's a great case study from Harkin about this that will be shared in the post-call resources as well. Um, so you'll find that there. Another one that we wanted to introduce that maybe you all have heard before is systems thinking. Um, so systems thinking, and I stole this definition from journalism design, who has a great systems thinking toolkit that is also gonna be shared in the post-call resources. Um, it's a way of looking at the world and the underlying connections, patterns, and ideas that shape it, a set of tools for understanding complex problems and identifying opportunities for learning and change. Um, and systems thinking is useful for journalists to pursue because it helps us contextualize the events that we cover, particularly getting to sort of root causes of problems and do coverage that they can begin to fix those problems. And that is sort of that last part is really what takes us into 
community centricity, not just audience centricity, is taking some ownership, the responsibility to do journalism that helps fix some of those problems we have. Um, the, one of the best ways to sort of enter into systems thinking is to start with something called the iceberg model. This visual is also from journalism design from their systems thinking toolkit. Um, but what you see here is sort of at the tip of the iceberg, the only thing that you can see above the surface of the water is sort of the event that has just happened or the events that are happening that you as journalists are sort of very attuned to. That's where a lot of news organizations stop. Um, Maybe they go to this next level here below the water, the first, the sort of middle part of the iceberg, the trends and patterns. What has been happening over time that caused this event to happen or that played into the fact that this event happened? Um, and then below that, if you take a step further, which is even less common for news organizations to do, is to look at the structures of the system in which you exist and how they contributed to that event and how they caused those trends and patterns to emerge. How are the interconnected policy structures and power dynamics fueling those patterns that you talked about one step further? And at the bottom, bottom, bottom of this, this is like a deep conversation, um, is the sort of mental models that cause the system to exist this way in the first place. Um, so why is it structured to say what assumptions, beliefs, experiences, and worldviews are driving the system to exist the way that it does? This sounds really cosmic. Um, <laughs> I know, but on the next slide, we actually got a great example from El Tifano in the Bay Area about what it looks like when they applied this to coverage. And so hopefully this helps make this a little bit less abstract, a little bit less overwhelming. Um, so they applied this during the pandemic. Um, they broke down sort of reports of a COVID outbreak at a supermarket in Oakland that brought a lot of attention to the incredibly disparate rates of, of uh, COVID in Oakland's Latino community. So that's the event, a really big COVID outbreak in Oakland's Latino community. You go one step below that um, to the trends and patterns that caused that. They looked at the rising and the rising cost of rent prices, stagnant wages at the bottom end of the job market, because um, the outbreak was caused in large part by overcrowded housing in the area around that. And so they're like, well, what caused the overcrowded housing? It was the stagnant wages. It was the rising cost of rent prices that were causing people, multiple families to sort of crowd into housing together. Then what is the structure that led to these rising costs of rent prices, the stagnant wages, the outbreak, immigration policy that created fear and distrust, limitations on rent control, language barriers, political influence of property owners. You sort of see here, what are some of the structures of the system that led to this event happening in the first place? And then if you really get to that deeper level of mental models, they identified things like the idea that housing is a commodity, not a right. So not everybody is entitled to affordable housing, um, that immigrants don't deserve government help and can't get subsidies for housing much of the time. Um, and something I meant to mention at the top is they actually did this, this um, breakdown with members of the community that had been affected by the pandemic. So this wasn't just the members of the Tumpano's team, but they brought many community members into this conversation. And that's some of the things that surface here that their team members hadn't necessarily considered. And in the uh, links to the, in the slide links that we'll share with you after, you'll actually see a case study that El Tumpano wrote that broke this down a lot more, in a lot more depth. Um, and last thing is this sort of iceberg model in practice. When I asked them sort of when it was the results of this brainstorm process or anything you can share, they really just finished it and are just beginning to sort of make, take action on the sort of stories that come out of this. Um, but they um, shared with me the story that they recently published by one of the reporters about how, how immigrants were facing incredibly high rates of evictions um, and their barriers to rent relief. And that was another thing that was sort of fueling the overcrowding that led to this outbreak in the first place. But the outbreak is what made them realize just how bad the sort of housing shortage and access to affordable housing was for the Latino immigrant community in Oakland. John. Awesome, awesome. Um, sorry, there's a delay when I try to unmute my mic. So sorry about that, y'all. Uh, but um, before I dive into the information needs assessment, um, uh, Lloyd, um, to answer your question in the resources uh, slide that we're gonna show you at the end, um, we'll direct you uh, to uh, what, you're, uh, what, you're, uh, what you're asking for here. Um, but um, information needs assessments, um, I think um, are something that um, is very critical um, to uh, the kind of work that we're talking about. So kind of a quick breakdown of what it is. It's, it's really a way to determine what your community's information needs are, um, what value you as a journalist or you as a news organization can bring to your community, um, what information gaps you can fill 
built and what your community's uh, assets are. And I think that that um, last part uh, is really important. Um, uh, Fiona uh, Morgan, who's on the call, uh, talks about that a lot um, in thinking that like there are things um, in your community uh, that you can really, really put to use as a journalist, um, you know, uh, places and people. Um, and those are things that, you know, uh, people should keep in mind as they're, you know, taking a look at what's in the specific community that they're trying to serve. I think what's also interesting about this is that people in communities get information in a lot of different ways, right? Like people that don't have anything to do with news organizations, right? There may be um, community organizations based on a topic that they're interested in. Uh, a lot of people um, may hear about what's going on in the community through church, through their neighbors, through um, you know local schools, uh, you know whatever they are. And I think that a good way to think about this, which is what Fiona talks about a lot, is thinking about what journalism actually has to offer. Um, in a specific community. It, it it has something to offer, but kind of how does it fit in um, with all the other ways that people in the community get information, a library, um, and then, you know, journalists and news organizations can think about what are the real information gaps um, that we can actually fill. Um, and then in terms of why it's useful, um, it gives news organizations, I think, a reality-based view of, you know, where to focus their reporting and what issues are um, important to their community members, not just audience members who respond to call outs. Um, um, and I think it also dives into how you should deliver that information to your community. Um, and I think that a lot of times, uh, you know, we as journalists kind of make assumptions um, on how people actually want to receive the information uh, that, you know, we have to give them. Um, and, you know, a little bit of listening to the people who you're actually uh, working for, um, I think would help. Um, and then in terms of some questions uh, that you might ask uh, during an information needs assessment, um, I think this list is pretty good. So the first one is, what do the people in your community need to know on a daily basis? Like what are, what are basic things that they need to know to live their lives? And then, you know, you kind of take a step into, well, how do they already get that information right now? Is it any of those uh, sources or ways that I just spoke about, or is there something that, you know, we haven't thought of, like, how do they get the information that they need? If it's from a, you know, a news organization or a Facebook page or something, uh, great. But if it's from another place, um, then it would be good to, to know about that. And then, you know, we have to think too, what is what is stopping certain groups of people from getting that important information that they actually need right is it a language barrier um you know in a place like west virginia um it could be access to the internet right like there are there are a lot of different things that stop people um from getting the information that they need and i think that goes into the next one right is who's not being served right i think you know we've heard um and, and we've read stories about communities feeling like you know, local media um, doesn't serve them or the media doesn't serve them. And I think that's a valid argument, but I think that, you know, when you're doing this kind of work, it's important to look at who and, you know, why. Um, and, you know, what's their relationship like with the local media? Do they trust the local media? Do they historically, you know, agree with the coverage that's been um, done by a news organization about their community? Um, and then, um, you know, what we mentioned earlier is, what gaps do we think a news or what information gaps do we think a news organization can fill? Is there a way that somebody needs to get information or is there information that somebody needs that they're not currently getting and how can a news organization uh, serve that um, or, or serve them? Um, and then, yeah, I, I talked about what journalism has to offer, kind of like what their value proposition is. Um, and then it's, you know, what, what do people in your community, um, which is something that Fiona thinks about a lot and talks about a lot is, what do people in your community want you to know about their community as a journalist, right? Like, is it something about, um, you know, a historical fact about the community? Is it something about the makeup of the community? Like, what do people there, your readers or your community members uh, want you to actually know? Thank you. So we're excited to jump to some questions and, and hear from all of you. But, but before we do, we just wanted to say if this conversation has prompted excitement, curiosity, 
um, interest from, from you, we really encourage you to take these frameworks, take these ideas into consideration and use them within your organization. We, we pointed to a number of news organizations today that we really believe are, are living into this value of being community centric. And so we're here to help and we'll share these resources as we mentioned afterwards, but wanted to encourage you to, to take action and, and take some of these strategies into your newsroom and act on it. And we hope to introduce ones that didn't require necessarily an external consultant to get started or even anything more than probably some post-it notes and Sharpies. But all of these things is, um, are things that your organization could easily do with existing sort of resources um, and a little bit of extra extra time. Um, I encourage you to maybe grab, take one of these and bring them back to your team uh, from INN. And I think we can take questions for the remaining 10 minutes or so. Um, if we've got any. I, I have not also stop any, sharing so we can. Yeah, I haven't seen any questions come in, but you're welcome to either unmute yourself and ask the question of the panel or drop it into the yeah. chat. Um, could you all speak to the ways that a community approach can actually strengthen audience? Like what is the, the sort of the connection to sort of sustainability and trust with the audience that, you know, will that you're trying to deepen your relationship with? Yeah. I can I can jump in real quickly, just speaking to the documented slide that we showed earlier. Their reporting and the stories that come directly from their community are consistently the highest performing stories as well, right? So the fact that they have audience sensibilities, they're able to understand the data, helps them understand that these stories are working, right? And you know, we we mentioned this with the the documentary, right? But those those stories came directly from the community and then a film was able to be made. And that now can create sub-communities and increase their reach to other people that might not have known about their work, might not subscribe to a documented newsletter, but now they have another product that they can use to expand their reach, expand their brand. So I think that's a great example of how these stories are performing well. And um, that's that's a way to be both. And, and I think too, you know, I think about a place like Mountain State Spotlight, right? Like their first year, uh, they've been doing really, really well. And I think that a continuation of, you know, community focused stories will bring people in other parts of their community who aren't, you know, I guess audience members yet, who aren't donors, who aren't newsletter subscribers. If they see themselves reflected in the coverage, um, you know, then it may inspire them to take action, um, whether that's, you know, in a monetary way, whether that's, um, you know, subscribing to a newsletter or becoming a follower on social media or, you know, donating time or some other type of skill. Um, uh, I think that um, especially for new newsrooms, um, it's important because, um, you know, you're trying to build your audience, you're trying to grow. And I think if community members um, see themselves reflected in your in your coverage, uh, it may inspire them, um, as we said earlier, to, you know, fix something that um, they see uh, broken in, in the world, which is something I'm about to say uh, everywhere, because it is like a very poetic thing. So so I'm still in there. <laughs> I think the, the also the flip side of that is that people don't habitually read news that's not useful to them. And so by doing this sort of community centric work, I mean, there's only so much sort of site optimization and paid lead acquisition and whatnot that you can do to get people to read you regularly if they open up your newsletter and it's not relevant to them, if they don't feel reflected in it, it's talking about topics that they don't encounter in their daily lives. And so that's why the information needs assessment is so helpful because it tells you how to make your coverage more useful for people. Um, all of us are incredibly busy. How many unread newsletters are sitting in each of your inboxes right now because they're not as useful to you as you thought they would be when you signed up for them? Uh, you know, keep, keep in mind that, that that sort of utility is really what people are looking for when they develop a habit with a news organization. And I think it goes back to, um, you know, something uh, Sarah Alvarez and Candace at Outlier talk about. Um, I wanted to mention earlier, but it's this whole idea of kind of getting information to people beyond when they're just curious about something, right? Like sometimes you just kind of need to know what you need to know and like, and move on with your day. And I think that people appreciate that, right? Like people see that as a necessity. People see that, um, you know, as a public good that they need to live their lives. How about others? Any other questions? In these last couple minutes, um, I have a question. Uh, how do you deal with a newsroom where they tell you we already know what our audience wants to know about or hear? 
Um, I hear that one a lot. I mean, I think that there is, there's a, this is where data is incredibly helpful. This has been a rude awakening for so many news organizations who thought that they were covering the full landscape of their community, maybe when they were print, um, be based on the purchase, the uh, subscription rates and advertising rates. And then when they went digital, realized just how, what, what a small percentage of people in the community were reading the work. Um, I, I think that there, I, I would encourage you to sit down with the newsroom leaders and ask them to list all of the things that they think their readers want. And then think about how you might be able to design a survey or host interviews or do a series of focus groups in which you ask those same questions of audience members and then spend some time synthesizing the results of those two and exploring what gaps there are. Uh, at Membership Puzzle Project, we've helped many newsrooms sort of work through that question, those assumptions about their audience members and then go back and actually ask those same questions to audience to identify those gaps. That would be, I think, the least confrontational way to potentially do it. You're not saying that somebody's wrong. You're saying, let's take, put our assumptions down on paper and let's go and test those out by actually asking our audience members those well, same you, questions. You'll be amused because we did a little bit of that and a large number of the responses were, I've never heard of you guys. <laughs> well, it sounds like you already uh, figured out how to do this then and now you just have to figure out how to uh, make yourself uh, more useful to them then. Ariel, there was a request to go back to the screen that I think it was the final screen with the resource list. Yeah, I think the request was to share the link in the chat. Um, we need to clean this notes up uh, first, I think, or um, I can. Yeah, I, she wants us to share it in the chat. Michelle, are you going to be able to are, are the resources going to be shared afterwards with everybody on the INN site? I believe so. Yes. Um, so we will make sure that those get uploaded. I just, we have some internal notes and things like that in the slides, so we can't share them in the chat quite yet. <laughs> um, if there's a specific one uh, you want right now, Catherine, I can, uh, I can drop the link to you. Just let me know. I can put up on the screen again, though. Any other last questions or thoughts? Mm -hmm. Grab these. Great. So, so one thing that Ariel mentioned that I did want to draw attention to is around this this quest for relevancy, right? Because I think with news organizations that we have seen being relevant to the community, those community members then act as marketers for them, right? They tell other people, "Hey, are are you plugged into this information source?" And so they end up helping you as well with some of the audience work that you're seeking to do too. So, I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, I have another suggestion. Go ahead, Bruce. Oh, sorry. Um, actually, one of the things that we did, and it worked out very well, was we went around to the more active activist groups, and we said, how can we help you? How can we cover what you're doing? And in many cases, the mapping that you're talking about and the networks that you're talking about, they'd already done they just couldn't get any coverage from the commercial media. So they were more than happy to say, yeah, you should talk about this. You go, you should go see this. Here's some documents for that. And, uh, you know, basically just open up a whole cupboard of stuff. That's it. Great. Thank you. I see a question, uh, uh, from Lloyd. Um, let's see, sorry. I'm there. Are there models of other news organizations organizations addressing something similar? Any thoughts from the panel? A need to cover a niche audience issue that will shape this town for the long term. Um, that's a great uh, question, Lloyd. And we do see people employ information needs assessments um, and sort of design thinking to very specific topical areas and going really deep on that particular topic. Is that um, sort of, am I understanding the question right? That's sort of what you're getting at there is when it might make sense to go deep on a niche issue that has broader relevance for the community. Uh, um, I think one of the best examples of that probably comes from KPCC uh, in Los Angeles. They do a number of great sort of deep dives on topics. Um, they did this with the census, uh, the 2020 census. They did this with early childhood education in the community. Um, let me see if I can pull up. They have a great blog where they talk about all of their engagement work. Um, and they have some pretty great case studies of examples of how they sort of embarked on, for example, understanding what 
prevented people from participating in the census and how they can get the word out and how they can sort of drive home the value of participating in the census for those who've been sort of left out of the conversation, for example. So I'm gonna drop that link to their blog right here in the chat um, and you can dig deep into some of their sort of specific uh, topics there. Might be a great example. Um, and then Bert had a, a question about the tension between community growth versus revenue growth. This was paywalls, paid subscriptions. So I think in this space, right, we're, we're really focused on news that's free and accessible to all, right? And, and thinking of news as a public good. So I think um, we will see a lot of for-profit organizations and, and legacy media that struggle with this, right? Because their revenue model is, is subscriptions. But we're also seeing a lot of these for-profit organizations start to think about news as a public good via special projects and, and getting philanthropic support for certain stories that that would be um, in front of a paywall. So I think that question in and of itself makes me think of the need for, for all of us that are here, right? To, to make sure that we can think of diverse revenue streams, we can think about diversified funding, and we can think about connecting everything to the mission of serving a community so that then we can go make those pitches to major donors and institutional funders and, and also you know, local businesses that will wanna be sponsors as well. Okay. I think that's a great point that Fiona just dropped here at the end is a great point to sort of conclude on is, is not every member of the community you serve is gonna be able to contribute money to the organization, nor are they gonna be the target audience for a sponsor, but it could drive audience revenue and philanthropic support indirectly. I think that's what, when Anna and I spoke about how being community centric can help you diversify your revenue, that's, that's really key is philanthropic organizations, community foundations are looking for you to be serving members of the community that are not necessarily ever going to become paid subscribers. Um, and so making sure that you are serving both ends of the spectrum in your community opens up new opportunities for revenue. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to open this conversation up is, is serving those people who might not ever become subscribers or members has its own sort of um, value to your sustainability efforts. Um, it's certainly not something that you do um, that, that is not going to beget support if you do it well. Well, I want to thank everyone.